It's time for fun, learning, commentary, laughs, and more care of the most diverse group in the genealogy and family history world. Black Progen Live. Black Progen. Black Progen Live. Welcome to Black Progen Live with your hosts, Nika and True, and the baddest panel in these pedigree streets. Black Pro Gen. Black Pro Gen Live. Black Pro Gen Live. Alito Chimachukma. The unapologetic black and people of color viewpoint. Genealogy, family history research with flavor. Hello, what's going on? Happy Black History Month. We are here with episode 103 of Black Pro Gen Live. Thank you so much for joining us from wherever you're tuning in at. Tonight's episode, if you've ever wanted to craft a narrative for your ancestors, but you weren't sure where to start, in this episode, we'll discuss how to use the facts you generated to create a narrative that can be used across all different types of media. Thanks so much for joining us for Breaking ancestral narratives free. Always be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel so you don't miss anything revolving around Black Progen Live, History Unscripted, or perhaps even something else that I'm posting on uh, the channel. So be sure to hit that subscribe button now and also be sure to hit the bell so then that way you're notified whenever uh, something is posted or I'm going live. Also, be sure to like us on Twitter at Black Progen and follow us on Facebook. Um, and be sure to go to, to the uh, upcoming live episodes area of the channel and then that way you can click set reminder on the episodes that you are interested in. All right. What is going on, everybody? We've got a semi-packed panel for tonight's episode. So much to talk about, so much going on. Let's see. I think we'll start with our newbies. Yeah, we'll get you out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> First, I know I'm so sorry. We've got a new resident Y chromosome in the house. This is my buddy with the best beard in the game. Okay, I'm telling you, nobody is beating this guy's beard. Please welcome to the panel for his first episode of Black Pro Gen Live, Andre Farrell. Hey, everyone. Glad to be here. Thanks, Nika, and look forward to my first time on Black Pro Gen Live. <laughs> all right, all right. You'll do excellent, I'm sure. I am sure. All right, got a little green. With my matches my pink headphones. It's great for me and Bernice. All right, next up, down to the state of Virginia, our tour guide extraordinaire and Danville expert, <laughs> our girl, Reese Luck Brimmer. How are you doing tonight? Hi everyone, I am Reese from Southside, Virginia, where all roots meet. And I am excited to be a new panelist on Black, Black Pro Gen Live. And I just look forward to learning and sharing. All right, I'm glad you do. Tilt your camera down just a little bit because we want to see those earrings. Those are super cute. Ooh, yep. Oh, oh yes. Girl. You see the colors? Yeah. Check I see the out. colors. Check them out. Yes. All right. All right. Now, going back to some of our old school Black Progen alumni, auntie number one in Florida, the state that we love to hate, but we love her, <laughs> even though she's in it. <laughs> <laughs> Ella Fernanda Sacco. Hey, everyone. It's so problematic. This state is so problematic. But what can you say? You got to hope for the best. Um. <laughs> You need to rent out all those books in your, behind you to a lot of people for them to read in the state of Florida sometimes. Um, Maybe, but yeah. Yeah, but shout out today would have been Trayvon Martin's 25th birthday. That completely blows my mind um, that that's just how long ago that incident took place. Uh, so please keep your parents in, in your prayers and thoughts today because that's probably a hard anniversary to have to commemorate. All right, other resident auntie? who is in the state of Maryland. She's uh, she's reaching out and touching Andre. I don't know how far away they live away from each other, but <laughs> what's going on, Bernice Alexander Bennett? And hello everyone and everything's going on. It's Black History Month. We have an opportunity to just talk about Black history and to really honor our ancestors. Absolutely. And last but not least, my co-host, Machu, what's going on, girl? 
Hey everybody, it's your girl True Lewis of My True Roots and it's Black History Month, but as you know, it's 24-7, 365 for us. So I'm here at a cold and expecting snow, 37 degrees here at Fort Knox. And I just left Portsmouth, Virginia, where it's 70 degrees for two weeks. So I just want to thank you, Nika, for holding down the fort. Um, it's much appreciated. So I just wanted to let you know that personally. Oh, that's my yeah. booty. Anytime, you know, I catch you, you fall. We got this, you know, you got to go on the, uh, when they do the the, the team building ex- <laughs> stuff at the yes. job where you got to, I surrender myself or whatever you have to say, you have to fall. It's all right. Yes. I got you. Thanks. So we've had a busy, it's been busy, you guys. Since the last time we had a live show, we've done two crew chats on Twitter. We did Roots yesterday we did soul food at the end of january we did uh what was a color purple at the beginning of january and then we're rolling into another twitter chat another episode next week we've just got a lot of stuff going on in the world of black progen so hopefully you guys have caught all of the updates the posts and whatnot um definitely want to say hello to everyone in our chat room there's a lot of folks in there michelle Mahler, how are you doing dale e colston darnisha pickett hey girl Riatra, I think I'm saying that right. I'm sorry, Miss Hubbard. We're just going to call you Miss Hubbard. Denise Muhammad, what's going on? Angela Walton Raji, one of our panelists. Hello, Tier. How are you? Andre's daddy is in the house. We want to shout out Mr. Pharrell in the chat room. How you doing, Dad? Thank you for joining us on tonight's episode. Does Dad, is Dad able to grow a beard like that too? He had one in his 20s, but you know, he's real corporate and professional. So, he, you know, he keeps the corporate mustache. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he went he went moderate he went over teddy p it's like a i don't know it's more it's more isaac hayes ish um it's a combo of teddy and isaac i i have to show you a picture later okay okay because that's my favorite era is the in-between afro and jerry curl era for black hair i love it it's one of my <laughs> personal favorites um, Cecilia Matoyer, uh, there's so many people in the chat room. Thank you guys so much for joining. It's going to be a lively conversation. Um, everyone on the panel has in some way, shape or form taken a narrative, you know, a historical narrative and, and repurposed it in a way that makes it, you know, accessible and um, allows other people to transfer what they've learned from that particular narrative in, into their lives and to pass the information on. And so that's a key reason why you see some of the people on the panel that you see, or just really everyone on the panel that you see. And so, um, you know, I think Bernice can attest to this, um, being um, a coordinator of the writing track at Maggie, along with Angela Walton Raji, who is also a coordinator of the writing track at Maggie, which is not being offered this year, but it has been offered, it will be offered again at some point. People have the hardest time going from the research phase into repurposing what they're going to do into whatever format it is. And I think it's sometimes it's writer's block, sometimes it's a, it's imagination, sometimes it's fe- a failure, a fear of failure. Sometimes it is, um, you know, you're, you're your own worst enemy. It's a lot of different little roadblocks that people have that, that get in the way from, from that. So let's talk about whatever the project is, right? What, what we're gonna take you through in terms of this, the conversation tonight are the steps that you should really be thinking about when it comes to whatever you're gonna develop, right? You need to get these things out of the way and answered and these questions answered first before you can decide, this is what I'm going to do. If you don't have these things established at the ground level, you're gonna be flailing all over the place and you're gonna lose focus. You might you might lose interest um, and you may, especially if you've reached out to people to help you with stuff, they may get frustrated with you because it's like, you don't know what the heck you're doing. <laughs> so we wanna make sure that you don't get there, that you don't frustrate yourself and you don't get you don't frustrate other people. So um, the first question that I have is in terms of projects, right? The first thing you need to think about is your audience. Who is your audience for your project, right? And so let's have a conversation about audiences. When we're speaking in terms of genealogical spaces, right? Um, I'll ask you first, Reese, because you are leading these amazing historical tours in Danville, right? Genealogists don't typically think about tours as a form of a narrative or, or spreading the genealogical gospel or the historical gospel, mm-hmm. right? Who is your audience for the tours that you give? Well, um, I've had college students um, what I've been doing lately is par- partnering with the local university, and they have a group there called the Center for Career Competitiveness and Community Engagement. 
And we've been partnering on these civil rights tours that we use the red trolley on. And um, we've had students, we've had history professors, um, new people coming into town, um, just, uh, just general people who wanna know about the um, civil rights history that we have here in the city. So from the young to the old, from people who are just moving here to people who have lived here their whole lives and just don't know these stories. And that, I think that's something that, that you just said that is really key, right? Is that mm -hmm. here you are in an environment, there are people who are living around you or around the area that they're touring that don't have, they don't know anything about what you're talking about, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so there's a level of sort of like evangelism um, or, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's moving it beyond like, hey, let's just put together a pamphlet or let's put together a flyer and it's making it alive and active. Um, Bernice, yes. talk about- Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, go ahead, Reese. No, because no, um, no. it connects people to the communities that they live in and they come from. You know where they work, um, and that's what genealogy does for me on these tours because I'm able to not only say, okay, this house, so and so lived in this house, but I'm able to say, okay, do you know that such and such is a descendant of this person, and do you know what they've done? You know, so. That's just one. Yeah, and, and, and something that I for, forgot to do um, that we started doing in this season is before we get super into the conversation, I want to make sure to direct you guys back to previous episodes where some of the things that we're talking about fit in with the conversation that we're having tonight. So um, definitely episode 66, publishing the family story from oral history to narrative. If you are very intent on putting together a book for a family reunion or just for yourself, that is a great episode uh, where people share their tips and tricks on what they did to put on to put a family history together. Episode 63, what about you? Documenting your own story, removing us from being the researcher and actually being the subject of the research and capturing our stories as they are taking place right now. Great episode for that. Uh, last season we did Birthright, Who Has the Right to Tell My People's Stories? Oh, that was a good episode. We probably need a part two <laughs> on that one because baby. Yes. Yes, ma'am. It went down. Um, so especially if, you know, and we're going to get into some of those conversations tonight about who has the right to tell certain stories, because because you got to deal with that and you got to treat that, especially if something potentially traumatic happened in your family and you want to be the one to talk about it. So, yeah, we're going to go there um, tonight as well. Um, episode 47, Pat and my pen, writing your family history. And then, of course, episode 23, telling the story without boring your family. We want to make sure people are staying awake so that they get all the nuggets that you have found. <laughs> so, all right. So moving forward, audience, right? Let's continue talking about audience. Now, here's the thing. Your audience is very specific, right? These are people who are coming to Danville, Reese, who, who have an interest in history. But Bernice, you wrote a book. And right. who was the audience for your book? Well, the first uh, audience was were family members. The second audience were people within the community. And then the third audience was my, were my colleagues, the general genealogy community. And I think you brought up an important point um, that there usually is more than one audience for whatever you're doing. You all, you're gonna usually have a primary audience and then you're gonna have a secondary audience, right? And Reese sort of said this in what she just was talking about. She said, oh, these are people who have interest in history. And then, then we get the siphon from the university, right? So there's, there's still two audiences, right? Um, but here's the thing, what I think sometimes, and let, let's open this up to everybody. What do you think is an issue that the genealogists have with even just knowing who their audience is? Right? Do we make it too broad at the beginning? Andre, what do you think? I think we do make it too broad because I think about my own struggles with the writing. I have all the research. I've seen all the research. I have all the facts. I have all the data. But then it's the notion of, well, it's, the, it's, it's um, Shelly's question of, so what? It's like, why does this matter? What, what else do I need to be doing? And so we become our worst enemies when we're looking at what we're researching and how do we translate that into a narrative that's worth someone else wanting to read. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. True. What do you think? Do you think we make the audience too broad? Ellen, what do you guys think? Um, 
I don't know. I kind of like was doing it for myself at first, right? And then I, after that, I, I did broaden it to uh, my family because, of course, you know, I made the documentary. And at the same time, you know, after that, I did my blog. So then I, I did, I, I felt comfortable enough to make it to a wider audience. I think I was needed to be comfortable within myself and then I needed to do it for my family. And then I was like, okay, this is good enough for the world to see now. So um, and I, I don't know I if I'm necessarily right. really worried about the broader aspect of it because I knew what I had, my content and my research it was important to me because I just really felt like my story needed to be told. And I really believed in that. And if it, if nobody else did, I needed to do it for myself. Mm, and I think you're bringing so you're bringing up a very important point though, is that initially the audience is us. Right. Right. Like it could later, it could change, but yeah. the original audience was us because in order for Bernice to write the book, she had to be entertained by what she read and, and it had to <laughs> compel her to feel, no, seriously, it had to compel her to feel like it was a story that was worth being told. Exactly. Right? You're right. You know, yes. yeah. yeah. But Andre brought up an interesting point in that he has so much research. And so what you have to do is determine, okay, what, what needs to be told and how do I tell it? And sometimes you don't tell it all at one time. Sometimes you have to break it up and make it small stories, but you have to have a direction. You have to have an outline with one question. You know, what am I doing? What is the question? And when you say, okay, this is the question right now. So how do I prove I can answer the question? And then you start developing your story based upon the evidence that you have, mm -hmm. which may not, as I said, be everything that you have in your arsenal. You may have to hold that off and come back and tell another story. And I find myself doing that now where it's, it is a focus or I'm leaving the question, a question unopened. I'm, I'm telling them what I know and leaving it up to them so that they can you know, participate with me in my story and say, okay, well, I think this, this, and that. Sometimes it's an unended question, you know, Mark. Um, that's fine too. But yeah, it's kind of like that ebbs and flows, you know, I've kind of been on a roller coaster, but I think now I'm in that, that area, area of my research where I'm like focused on something instead of trying to put it all in one big thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you guys think that there's a pressure for everyone? Um, and Ellen, I ask you this. Do you think there's a pressure for everyone to live up to what we see on television when it comes to history and genealogy? That that people, be, because we have these ideas of roots or the book roots or the television show roots or finding your roots or long lost family or, you know what I mean? Like, right? We've definitely. got like a hundred different things, right? Genealogy you, wrote you, jokes. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, okay, exactly. Right? <laughs> let, me, let me add all of them. All yeah. of them. Um, but do you think there's a pre people feel a pressure, right? Like if, if my stuff doesn't look like that, then right. it's not right. It, even the writing, right? Mm -hmm. um, Angela had a very good comment in the, in the chat room where she said, sometimes people also want to write the sequel to Roots while ignoring the golden story that they have coming from their community. What, 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 what would you add to this, to this part well, of the conversation I mean, about yeah, audience? Think if you if you get to the end of the program and you actually sit there through the credits you start to realize you're like one person writing your story and, and developing this thing but actually what you're seeing on television has something like anywhere from 60 100 200 people that have been involved to make this little seamless thing for this hour you know it's there's so much that goes into it and it's it's really an unfair standard but on the other hand it also shapes i think of what a lot of people think it should look like as well so then it also almost gives people a little box that they have to figure out, well, that's not what I need to do, you know, to get out of it. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. So, so here's the thing. The first, the first framework you should think about is who is the project for? That's what we're talking about audience. What does the audience want? And that's something that you're going to have to step out on faith and reach out to people that you trust to ask that question, because we're all going to give different answers, right? Like if I go ask the panel, 
okay, we've got, you know, uh, I don't know, since this book is sitting on my desk, I'll reach for it. Okay, we got this, this, let's just assume we have a picture of this man, Crawford Goldsby. That's all we know, okay? There's gallows, people getting hung, it's a whole crowd. What do you want to hear about this story? What kind of, what, what, what is something that you would want from that, right? Would you want a photo project? Would you want a book? Would you want a podcast about how he got to the gallows? Would you want a documentary? Would you want a, a fictional movie based off of that, right? The only way you know what your audience wants is to ask. You can't always assume because for me, if they, if Art Burton decided that he was going to do the genealogy of Cherokee Bill, I would not, now granted he sent me this book, but still I wouldn't have bought it because I don't, for me, genealogies don't speak to me like the long format book because I put them together and I'm about I'm about I'm about ready to throw the computer by the time I'm done (laughs) those don't speak to me but your audience your target audience you need to kind of hold the folks and you know just a few people and say what do you think would be a great way for me to share this story and if you don't have and and really ask people outside of the genealogy community don't ask genealogists because we're going to say, well, you got to have a record that you leave behind and that's yes. the people you need the census. And well, it's like, yes, you do. But but no, you don't. Because if somebody is really that interested, they're going to look it up on their own. Right? Yes. They're going to so, want to fact check. What you said <laughs> to make sure that, you know, if I said he shot 200 rounds at a person or blah, 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 they're going to want to go back and fact check. So the next thing, um, the next part of the initial planning is how does your project deliver what your audience wants? Because you have to figure out what they want. And then how does your project deliver it? If you can't answer those questions, you sit on what you think you're going to do. Don't even go any forward. Don't, don't go further. Um, and then from that point, then you're going to go into the creation phase, right? And some of this is you may have to, just like Ellen said, these shows have several writers. They've got a research team. They've got all sorts of stuff, right? It's not a one person operation. Um, So you may need time. You may need to hire other people to help you and act your vision, or maybe they have a bigger vision than you do because you are hampered by the money involved, the resources, your own time and talent, right? Sometimes you have to bring in other people like Bernice, didn't you have to bring in an editor for your book? Yes. Mm-hmm. And, yes, and did I you know think, what did, I want, go ahead. I was just gonna say, when you talk about what, do, what, what does the audience want? You also have to think about, well, am I going to tell a story or am I going to make a history book? Or as you said, the genealogy that maybe some people don't even wanna know about the genealogy. But what people do want is truth. They want evidence. They want, you know, any supporting document where you're telling that story. And they want to also start off with what's the question? You know, if I if I tell you I'm writing something and you'll say why, then I'll have to say because. Well, I think somewhere in your introduction, you're going to lay out why you're doing what you're doing in the first place and or formulate your thesis and then take it through in some kind of way so that people know just what you're doing and what the story is all about. And, and, and you also too, I think we have the flexibility now where we're not dependent on a traditional publishing company to where mm-hmm. if you wanted to answer the question why in the first chapter of the book, rather than an introduction, you could spend the whole first chapter talking about why, the why. That's right. Mm-hmm. You've got to have a why. If you don't have a why, then people don't know what you're doing. And it comes off like you don't know what you're doing. (laughs) Right. So if you don't know what you're doing, how do you know you've done it? (laughs) Well, because part of that is engagement. Like I've read several books and I'm looking at it of A, what's in it for me, but then also why should I care? And so oftentimes writers, God bless them sometimes they need a ghost writer to help them with some of their writing and helping them with their narrative because some of them aren't writers. They know the story. They probably can articulate it very well speaking, but from a writing perspective, not their business. That's why people don't always have to write. I mean, they don't, they don't always have to write a book. They can do a documentary. They can do other things. Um, and I think that's the one thing that we have to talk about. 
Sorry. Just how how do you actualize this this why? <laughs> Absolutely. But I also see we, we didn't touch on the generation part because part of this conversation is about some of your younger generation folks aren't necessarily gravitating towards the book, even though I would gravitate towards the book. But, you know, you have in, um, mediums like video where everyone's doing those videos. So mm -hmm. maybe it is about, hey, getting this camera in front of me. Everyone's phones are great now. Take great photos, create great videos and telling that story that way. And it may come off better mm -hmm. with them telling their story and telling that story versus it coming in writing for that younger person. Reese, are you gonna say something? Um, yes, uh, even with my tours, like, you know, they're, you know, I've been developing them for a while, but a lot of them are fairly new. So people, they still have the wow factor, but some of the young people, you know, they're, everything is technology, you know, so they're like, you know, well, this is good. And we're listening to you talk and all of this stuff. But what about creating some pamphlets that, you know, we can and add QR codes, where we can just use our phone and we can just read the stories, you know, as we're going along. So um, you have to think about all of those things, you know, when, you know, dealing with the audience, like, you know, what they want. And, I find that a lot of the youth there, everything is technology based, so. Well, and I think you're bringing up a very important point too, is that this isn't something that stays like static, right? Like, yes, when you put the book together, you thought about a particular audience, you thought about what they wanted, but if you do a second edition of that book, the audience needs could change, right? you know, uh, it could shift, right? Um, just because right. maybe the landscape has changed, maybe more records are made available based on that topic. Maybe, you know, some new research came forth and whatever it is, right? And so just like how you're talking about on your tour, how you're, you're trying to think of new ways for you to incorporate technology into what you're doing, that's responding to what the audience wants versus you saying, my tour is fine. I don't need nothing. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I got my grant, whatever, I'm good, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the way this works, right? See. Right. The thing is, we all know if you successfully reach a person when it comes to research and genealogy and history, you've got them for a long time. But if you don't reach them and you're ignorant and you don't want to change, they're going to disengage and they're going to they're going to start nodding off at you like your family when you just throw a census page in front of them and tell them to read it. And the folks don't know how to read handwriting. <laughs> I digress. Anywho, so after you start the creation process, right, whatever you picked, whether and this is this is what we're going to remind you, it could be a book. It could be a podcast. It could be a documentary. It could be a fictional movie. It could be an app. It could be, um, you know, maybe you put together a written product that you give out at that, that folks give out at the, at the archives near where your family is from. Maybe it's a website. Maybe it's a Twitter account. Maybe it's an Instagram. All of these things are centered around a narrative or maybe it's a tour, right? All these things are centered, centered around a particular narrative. Yes, maybe it's a play. Maybe it's a three or four act play. Maybe it's Hamilton starring people of color. Come on now, think about it. That is no different than what we're talking about, y'all. Seriously, the only thing that's different is that it's Lin-Manuel Miranda and he knows how to write songs very quickly because he used to write them for Sesame Street. That is true. Lin-Manuel Miranda used to write for Sesame Street. <laughs> so that's using gifts and talents repurposing them, reimagining them in a way that makes it alive and active. So once you start the process, does your project work? You got to ask this question, right? Reese's is working, but the young people said, no, we need some QR codes, right? How does it work? Why is it working? What choices can the audience make based on consuming your project, right? Whether they're hearing it, look, what, what, what choices can they make? Can they decide I wanna go out and seek more information about this? Maybe I wanna see where my ancestors fit in with this story. Uh, maybe my family's around this area. Maybe I wanna find out how my ancestor lost their land to back taxes or, or maybe somebody came and stole the land and used the taxes as an, as an excuse, right? You right. want there to be a, you want the, I was waiting for you, right? <laughs> but there's gotta be, your work has to evoke a call to action somewhere somebody should be inspired or wanting to look for themselves or to learn more about the topic if somebody is not left with that go back to step one who's your audience 
what do they want? Anything uh, else you guys want to, uh, the last thing I'll add is you have to have an outcome. What did you see, uh, Bernice, what did you see as the outcome for you? Like, what was your finish line? You know, I ran through the, the, the tape and I put the medal on after the marathon. What was your, what was your outcome? My bottom line, my bottom line, starting with a story, starting with oral history, I wanted to prove that the oral history was right. So I ended up finding the land. That was what I was looking for and what happened to the land. And so taking folks through a journey gave them an opportunity to see how I went through this whole process of finding the land. Mm -hmm. Reese, what was your end outcome? Well, um, I would have to say that the, the people, they, you know, walked away with, um, they just walked away with the, a sense of pride, as you say, um, because a lot of them grew up in that community um, that I tour in, um, which is the Hallbrook Ross district. So it's like, okay, I didn't know that. I didn't know that there were African-American doctors in this neighborhood. I didn't know that there were lawyers. So um, from the students' perspective, it's like, okay, if they did this, you know, during the time, um, you know, of social injustice, you know, this is something that I can do too. Mm, that's good. Andre, for your end, right, of what, what you do as a audience person, what, how do you want to be inspired consuming things that are historical or genealogical? Just it's, it's the whole notion of Sankofa, you know, how, the, how can I move forward with this? So I am looking back at the history. I am looking back and being reflective of, okay, what does this mean to me? What does this mean for, you know, my cousins or nieces, nephews, you know, how can I share that information and help them rethink how they're doing things? And so I'm taking this as, okay, what is my call to action? What do I want to take for this? How do I share this? That's good. True. Yeah. <laughs> That's a hard one. Cause I, everybody made so many good suggestions. Um, I don't know. Can you like maybe clear up if I say what I'm saying? <laughs> like, it's all about that documenting for, you know, the unborn readers in my family. That has always been my main goal. Um, you know, I know it's the world and everybody else can see, but mainly that was always what it was for me was that um, it's documented. My stuff is up in D.C. with, you know, the Daughters of the American Revolution, my documentaries forever, my, you know, the kids and my family can take it and run with it and do what they want. The main thing was getting it started. Um, I'm just inspired too by my the youth in my family because you know I'm starting to see I've been doing this for a minute but I've been keeping my eye on the young folk so I can see that, that, that they're getting it now so um, yeah <laughs> well uh, I'll ask Ellen what's your end game for your blog right this is something that you started I remember you were you know you have been doing it for a while, but you kind of kicked it up another notch. You went to a dot com instead of a blog spot. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but that's a major step, you guys. I it mean, is. seriously, some buying people. Buying a domain. Yeah. Yeah, buying yeah. a domain and making the commitment to do hosting versus using something free, right? Because that means mm -hmm. you have to, ex ex you know, extend um, or expend resources, right, right. towards whatever mm -hmm. this is. And that's more permanent, right? right. So what do you see as your, um, as your outcome for, for what you're doing? Cause your audience is, may not be the same as everyone else, right? You're, you're working in spaces and in record sets that, that, I mean, are probably behind this brick wall that <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> people, right, that's sitting behind me. Um, like we were talking earlier today. I mean, you have this whole list of like enslaved people in Puerto Rico that like nobody knows about. Like she literally, you guys, Ellen has like in her brain, that bookshelf behind her. Oh, oh <laughs> yes. And, and we tried to take a book out like piecemeal to, and, and encourage her to take the book out and just set it on the table and like, we'll, we'll create the cover. We'll wrap the bow on it. We'll sell it. You just got to get it out of your brain. But I know that that's, that's a challenge for you. So what yeah, do you challenge? Yeah. I, I'm what, trying to think like, like just being here and having been doing that show. So then it was like, 
using some of this as a platform to then go off and do some more research. And then, so I can see that and, and to integrate it. And I really don't know who's, who it's for in a way, you know, because it's not like um, there's people in my family that have looked at it. They've looked at earlier blogs and this, and then other people who are really taken with these different narratives, but it is hard. It's like, I am thinking like, I would like to do videos of something more impromptu with, with the material that I have. And I, and I do need to do, I, do need, I need to get a book out. I just do, I have too many people asking me this and I haven't, I, it just, I get to a point and then I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, it's, it's so overwhelming, but. I yeah, understand I, that too, because you don't know where it's going to lead you because so many opportunities to do other things and step into other genres when we're, you know, we're genealogists, we're family history, but it sometimes goes over here and you're like, oh, I didn't know that that audience was watching right. or, you know, so I, I get what you're saying. And, Ellen, and it also that, touches to like not knowing. what you're saying is true. And also what like yeah. Andre said that there is a call to action. I want people to know these yes. first histories. I want them to know that, you know, yeah, there were these African ancestors in San Hedman. They were, they, they were there in Mocha, they're all over, you know, mm -hmm. they're here. And then I just keep seeing people wanting to connect up to other lines for other people. And I'm just kind of like, but this is so rich. There's so much going on and this is, this is what makes who we are. You know, oh, yeah. we but those know stories, stories and that that research must be shared because you have people who don't even know this. And yeah. you have that passion. And, and one of the things uh, is that once you once you ask the question and you have the passion and you move towards a certain goal, I think that everyone will benefit from that because I'm really right. into the black homesteaders. I mean, mm -hmm. that's my passion. I want everybody to know that black people <laughs> were homesteaders and they were not just homesteaders in the West. They were right. homesteaders in right. the South. Right. But the only way that I'm going to get this out is I have to keep telling the story. And I started with mine, but now I'm going to start telling everybody else's story because I feel that it's something that we have to get out there. Yeah. Because some family members don't even know. So Ellen, I mean, what you're doing, I think is, is very important. Get the information out there. Yeah, and I've already seen some people who are connecting with like the research I've done and they've been able to get back like the generation that they lost, they don't have access to. Yes, this. So yes. It's really amazing. And, and I keep thinking like what Angela said in episode 95, like she said, you got to really think about, you know, the direction of that narrative, that it's, that it's not I, me and ours, it's like versus they and them, you know, like that, that kind of like stepping away. And I think that's, that's something that, that brings people to you when it becomes I, me and ours, you know? It makes a space for people to come in. And, and there's a lot of books out there that they don't do that. And I think that with some genealogies, I think that's why there's such a turnoff at times. Come on now, you gotta take ownership and you gotta make the people a part of your heart. Mm -hmm. See, and, and that's the thing. That's part of the problem with a lot of folks that come in and consider people of color research to be niche. They're lacking mm -hmm. a connection to it because they don't have the heart, mm -hmm. right? It's not, it's not a part of the marrow of who they are. And, and, that, and your project will come off very contrived in that way if you have not connected with it in the ways that you need to, right? And so you know, it'll just come off hollow. People won't take you seriously because right. they know you're not there for the right reasons. They know that mm -hmm. you're there to profit, right? You know, it's the same reason why we get mad at how slavery is handled on a lot of television shows is because it's it's not taken, it's not handled with care, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or in the way it's not delivered in the way that we want it to be, you know? We don't want to see a blank line. We want to see the person's name. We want to see their age. And if you had found them, like you said you did, we'd mm -hmm. see a document with the name and with the age, not a blank line. And right. from, a right. reader's per, from a reader's perspective, um, I know for me, I just do not want to see the genealogies. Like Nika said, I want to see the, I want to hear the stories. I want to be mm -hmm. able to connect with a story, um, something that's just interesting. Um, because I'm going to tell you, you know, if I get a book, a lot of times I, I just like to support everybody in genealogy. So I just buy everybody's book. But a lot of times if they start off with just, 
you know, their family histories, because no one is going to care about that type of book unless they are, it's their family history. Right. Can and you say that one more time for the people? I don't want to know about your grandma and your grandpa. Maybe okay. a couple of resources, you know. Uh, can I can I put can there. I put my MP I'm gonna put my NPR voice on. Hi, Reese Buckwimmer. Can you please repeat that statement for the people in the back, please? <laughs> Hush, because you know how I feel about that. And I will put my two cents on this in a minute. <laughs> but other but I think it's so important because my first family history book, y'all. It was literally the report out of Family Tree Maker. Like I was like, yes, book done. You know, like, like that was. I was like, Press that button, but you know, I got chastised a lot for that in the beginning when I started yeah. that because I'm my true roots. I have to be true to myself and my family, and that is just mm -hmm. the way it is. Yes, I got sources. Yes, I got documents. Yes, I got evidence explained. But you won't get true. You won't get me. It. Everything on them blogs, I got over a hundred posts. There's a touch of true up in there. So, you know, that's just the way I roll. But a lot of times, you know, we get to this thing where we get sticky, but everybody is unique. I'm unique. Andre has his way. Reese, Bernice, Miss Angela, you know, she's melodic. That's my melody right there. Whenever I hear her <laughs> speak. Is. She's mm -hmm. so yeah. I, I'm not wearing I, red tonight. I, I like she get does. what you voice. all are saying. So I want to take tell the viewers, you know, be authentic, be be true to yourself, be true to your roots, be true to your 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 family history and your lineage, because you ain't gonna never fail with that. Trust me, I know. <laughs> well, and I, I there's I was talking to someone yesterday. Um, I forget. I was it was I was texting one of y'all, and yeah. I said, "There's no new ideas." Really, there is. It was me. You were texting me. <laughs> I was texting you. There really are no. I was like, I was texting one of y'all. Um, there, there are really no new ideas. Like nothing is really new. It's just a derivative of other stuff. The ingredient that is special is you, your unique thought process, your perspective on the world. Right? Like that's what. So, so Chu is gonna say things. She might use "ain't in y'all" on her blog and wish somebody oh, yeah. would mm -hmm. there. and say something. Just like me, I, I'm talking about regular ass black folks. I've been saying that for the last few days. I've had to walk in my own personal journey with being okay <laughs> with saying it works like ass, right? Like, yeah. right? But seriously, that's a journey <laughs> for me, you guys, because I was raised don't cuss like that, even though my my parents cuss like that every day. But outside of the house, no. But for me. That's my thing. And I have loved seeing people sharing stories about their regular ancestors that don't have a tie to, to, to famous people. I've been seeing my timeline lit up with that now. I love it. Yes. Give the, the possum catching granddaddies with, and, and cook it up a cornbed, you know, grandpa's mm -hmm. love. You know, like, why not? Those people survive for us to be here. But that's right. the thing. If you see an idea, steal like an artist. In fact, think about getting that book and reading it and seeing how you can repurpose. Angela and Bernice, all, all of them will tell you, Nika is the queen of looking at other stuff and <laughs> figuring out how I could use it for genealogy. Mm -hmm. I do it all the time. I was on a Zoom call yesterday with somebody who was trying to develop trainings for Black women in corporate spaces. And I was just talking to her about random stuff because you don't know who you're going to talk to, who you're going to meet, or what you're going to learn that can propel you and give you the idea that you need for whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. So let, let's shift gears a little bit because um, Angela is preaching a full sermon with decision time, a <laughs> communion, and a baptism <laughs> in, the in, the, <laughs> in the conference room, in the chat room. <laughs> Honey, she is laying folks out. There's fallout rags, everything in the in the, in the uh, chat room right now. Um, let's shift gears because we're let's talk about the behind the scenes stuff that can shape, shift, or sabotage your project. Yes, we did. We went full Jesse Jackson with those S's, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because there are things that can shape, shift, or sabotage your project. How can we address potential generational conflict that can arise when telling? your family stories, because that is a possibility. Somebody in Bernice's family could have said, don't you go out there talking about granddaddy, granddaddy, uh, uh, I don't know his name, <laughs> Lord Jesus, I forgot the man's name. Anyway, granddaddy Livingston Parish, don't be talking about him and his land and people will come and get us, right? Or mm -hmm. mama said, we don't talk about that, right? How do you address that? Because here we are getting this newfound information. We're looking at it from a very different lens than some of the folks who were directly involved 
what are some of the things that you can do to, to, to combat that? Bernice, I'll start out first since I got great at well, well, first of all, you know, when you talk about some of the stuff and you mentioned sabotage, you can find people hoarding documents and not willing to even share that information with you. Even if you ask a question, a simple question, mm -hmm. you may be told, maybe that happened a long time ago, leave it alone. There's that fear, you get half of the story, uh, there's some shame and some blame and, and some people just don't want others to have this negative view of their family. So they just keep that information to themselves and they don't share it at all. So how can we, you, you asked the, the question, how can we develop uh, some, some trust? Uh, we, we first have to talk to our family members. We have to say, listen, we're here to tell the truth. And sometimes the truth may have to come from you letting your relative know, I already know. I already have the answer. And I've experienced that where I was told, Bernice, leave it alone. So I found the truth and I went back to the person and said, this is what I discovered. And I think I kind of relieved some burden from that person by letting them know I knew so they no longer had to protect me, <laughs> you know, from the truth because I found the truth. But we have to go gentle. Uh, we have to uh, allow folks to express how they feel about you disclosing information. And sometimes, you know, you have to think, do no harm. You don't want to hurt your family. And if you find that whatever that secret is, they don't want to be told, you have to wait before you just run out and tell it. And you have to just let it go slowly. Whatever you're doing, deal with it slowly. Just don't say, well, I know everything and I'm going to tell everything. No, think about it first. But I think it's the building the trust that's important. And acknowledging that you know that how they feel. Reese, how did you address this with your tours and the people, maybe with the families or the folks that, that you're talking about on the tours? Mm -hmm. Well, um, there were a couple of stories um, that I talked about um, that were touchy, but, you know, I just thought about it, you know, when it comes to the tours, you know, this is separate from um, telling your own family history. Um, but I mean, these stories, um, I just feel that they have to be told and um, they have to be told by someone. And the thing about it is these stories, um, these stories, wait a minute, I'm losing my train of thought here because I'm um, on Bernice and the, <laughs> the family history stories. And oh, I was ready okay. to say something about the family history. Um, but uh, with the tours, I will say that one of my biggest things, it depends on who my audience is, I'm always worried about who I'm going to offend. Um, but I have to get over that. You know, I've learned that I have to get over that. Um, a lot of times the audience for my tours are white people. And they're coming on these tours to learn about the African-American history and the civil rights history. And sometimes I try to play devil's advocate a little bit. Um, some things that aren't even on my tours. I could be talking about a particular prominent African-American family, but then because I am the genealogist, I can also connect this prominent family to the slave owner that owned the land that their property was on, you know, where I'm giving this tour. So, which is um, what you should be doing as the <laughs> genealogist giving the tour. Yes. Um, so it's kind of, you know, I have this one story, you know, that I tell on the street, you know, um, I talk about the man who built the home, but um, something I bring up every now and again is the fact that his father um, was enslaved um, by his father. Um, proven by oral history, DNA evidence. The family tells this story. They've given me permission to tell this story. And I tell how he sued a prominent white family and it went all the way to the Supreme Court in the mid 1880s. 
Um, and that's usually a story that ruffles a couple of feathers because some of these people that take these tours, they might be connected to some of these families. Well. So, I mean, that, that's just one of the things that, you know, you have to deal with um, when it comes to these stories. Um, but when it comes to family history, um, I think that's a little bit more touchy. Um, it's definitely a little bit more touchy because you have, you know, these stories might include your mama. You know, and nobody wants to shame mama, you know, nope. so it's just a matter of getting permission, you know, um, because as genealogists, we want to tell these stories. We want these stories to be told, especially if it's something that relates to us, you know, so I just think it's about getting permission, um, you know, and seeing if well, they're comfortable, you know, well, and sometimes and, you got to wait for folks to die. Yeah, that's true. I, I said they it. Die out, you know, but, I said and, it. but, you know, oh, I got a few things I need to hold on to until that happens. <laughs> yeah, but, um, you yeah, know, my grandma said, scary. just keep that in your pocketbook, baby. You yeah. know, just, you got to keep it in your pocket. And, and it may be, that's the thing. So you guys, if you are really crafty and if the story is really worth telling and there's a, there's a potential blockade with the family member, you can tell aspects of the story, change the names, the locations, mm -hmm. maybe certain key details, right? You could you could do a Harper. Is that was his name from mm -hmm. uh, the Best Man? Yes, Tay Diggs. Yes. I forget his name. Sorry. Leave um, alone. You know Leave you can do. Alone. You know, like, granted, <laughs> granted, they they all knew who was involved, but he yeah. changed Ooh. some of the things, right? And mm -hmm. but you know, but he didn't go and ask for permission first to say, hey, right? That was why the whole movie got jacked up. We're gonna cover the Best Man later on Crew Chat what? later on episode of Queen Sugar. Yo, yes, a little, that yes. Blew up. that's yes. why you gotta yes, stay tuned to Black Pro Gen Live. Okay. <laughs> Tell your friends, call sure. your mama. <laughs> <laughs> but but the thing is, I mean, we're what we're talking about is navigating these complexities, right? And and yes. you know, we're constantly talking about who has the permission to tell stories. And in your mm -hmm. family, you know, you may have to go to the elders or maybe that there's nobody to ask when you initially start your project and then you find people that you probably should have asked at the beginning. Right. Mm -hmm. So you should you should probably do your due diligence. And here's the thing. This is also goes into asking the folks around you um, who are your potential audience what they think. Well, you know, what if I talk about this? What do you think are some potential issues that could arise? Because you may not think of certain things, but they may also think of things as well. Um, we've got a bunch of resources um, that, that True is going to put in the chat room. Uh, one of them is a genealogist writing room um, run by Anita um, Henderson, uh, one of our genealogy buddies. Um, another thing that a lot of us partic have participated in is NaNoWriMo or National Novel Writing Month. Um, there's a link for pep talks. There's, there's just ways for you to get kind of energized about writing um, things that you, you know, whatever. There's a ton of videos there to help you navigate that whole process. Um, G uh, there's a webinar that Bernice did um, for the Virtual Genealogical Association called Telling Your Story. And that's from a, uh, the webinar is part of the 2019 conference that they did last year. So we'll be sharing the link to that as well. StoryCorp, uh, that's probably one of the best ways to, to document stories nowadays. Um, pretty well bandwidth. You don't need to have a whole highfalutin, you know, situation. Um, they've got a whole DIY section of their website that can help you with different things um great resource master class love do not be short-sighted you do not need henry lewis gates to come on master class so you can work on your project you do not let me tell you why because there are plenty of other storytellers who are on that same platform in fact the panelists will tell you when i saw timberland as in the producer, when I saw that he was having a master class, I was ready to pay $100 to take. I, I don't even care about beats. Just because of his process. When you see this guy, the fact that he was creating stuff with just his mouth, that was it and a microphone. That's all he needed. I just want to see his creative process because for me, that might give me something that I need. Like, oh, maybe I can try that. Like even me watching Drink Champs yesterday. You guys may never watch Drink Champs. I love Noriega. He's a, he's a Puerto Rican and Black New York rapper and he's with the Miami DJ and they have a podcast where they literally sit up and drink with rappers and talk about stuff and they had a whole interview with Lil Wayne it's probably the most clear interview Lil Wayne has done in years where he sat for two <laughs> it sounds crazy he sat for more than two hours and he just talked about his life his work process one of the things he says he doesn't listen to a lot of other people's music 
he listens to music, but but some creative people feel like if you consume too much of what you're producing, it it affects what you put out, right? No, so, <laughs> girl, oh yeah, that I still haven't finished that interview. It's so okay. it is so good. Um, you'll find it. I posted yesterday on my Facebook page. All right. Um, yeah, but masterclass. Going back to that, amazing. Um, examples. Um, the Loving Generation, amazing series that was done. That was on uh, Facebook first, Facebook Watch, and then um, they've moved it to a different site that is all about biracial people living in the United States and their experiences. That's a great example, right? Mm -hmm. It does not have to be traditional genealogy. You guys, stop that. <laughs> okay what do i tell the panel all the time do you like how a website looks you like the text colors pay attention to that don't pay attention to the photos that they use to to advertise you buying that template for wordpress you are looking at aesthetics in this scenario same thing right uncivil podcast we love is all about the civil war it's a podcast so it's not even video this is audio just listen mm -hmm. to it and hear there may be an aspect or maybe a topic they talked about and how they talked about it. Maybe you want to share your family history or something you've learned in that exact same way. Bronzeville, another podcast. If you have not listened to that, it is so good. It is put together by Lorenz Tate and Lamar Tate. And it is about uh, the South Side of Chicago and, and gangsters. And they have all sorts of cameos from people. But it's still history, you guys. It's just remixed in a different way. Okay. It's like my niece adding peaches to a peach cobbler or adding uh, mangoes to a peach cobbler. Now you might not do it, but it might be good to her and it might be good to you after you eat it, right? Uh, Tracing Their Steps, a memoir. That's Bernice's book. We're going to put that link in the chat room. Another example, Freedmen of the Frontier, volume one. Angela went and got these dolls cards from several freedmen of the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw nations and wrote up a, a synopsis of the family history based on their DAWs cards and their DAWs application packets, right? Um, another book, Alila Bundles, the great, great granddaughter of Madam CJ Walker wrote a book about her, about her uh, great, great grandmother that has been adapted into a Netflix series starring, uh, Lord Octavia. Um, no, it's not Octavia. It's, um, she was in the help. I can't think of her name. Yes, it is. Octavia. It is Octavia. Octavia. Yeah. I was like, I don't know why I was getting her and Viola confused. I was seeing faces. I don't know why. Um, but that book that she wrote has been repurposed into a Netflix series. Yes. Okay. Another example, I have a multimedia project where I've written and I've done podcasts on research that I have, you guys. The sky is the limit. Don't allow your budget, your lack of vision, uh, what you think you can or cannot do to hamper getting the story out. It is one thing to say, I got to do a book or I got to do this. But you got to put boots on the ground and do the actual work to get to where you need to be. Anything else you guys want to uh, talk about before we go into comments? And we still have to ask Mariah, too, before we wrap up. Any, any last inspiration you want to give the people before the night is over? Um, this is more of, I guess, preaching to myself. <laughs> but just start where you are, you know. Um, we like they, you know, um, Andre said, we tend to gather all of this information and we pulled all of this information from all these different resources and we just don't know where to start, you know, and how to bring it all together. But I just say, just start somewhere. Also, I would say, don't let all of that hard work just sit in a drawer. Come a on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, come, come, true. I got to if turn you, you on. If you, you have the, yes. if you have to blog it, if you have to just get on a video and tell the story, yes, please let others know what you're doing. Share that wonderful uh, research. You know, your passion and your desire to find truth about your family, about your community is something that will become infectious. Others will want to know also. You have the opportunity to do that. I mean, I have a colleague right now who decided to put together a documentary of a community in, in New Orleans called A Place Called Desire. He had the passion to do this and he, he's finally done it. It, is, it. it will premiere next week. But don't stop with, oh, I have all this stuff. Nobody wants to know what I have. Yes, you're doing it to share it, Ellen. <laughs> you're doing it to share it, Reese, Andre, I mean, and all the people in the chat room. You have so much to give. 
And I think as a community, we have to look at ourselves as a community. The community needs to start talking because yes. if you don't do it, somebody else will. Mm-hmm. Come on now. Right. It makes me think of it, that article that I just saw that the Atlanta uh, Journey, Atlanta Journal Constitution put out about Rosewood. I don't know if you all yeah. saw it, but we we posted it on uh, the, the Black Virgin Live uh, Facebook page. Mm-hmm. And what they talked about was everyone sort of knew the story, had heard about it, but it wasn't until oh, one gosh. of the descendants came out yes. and mm-hmm. said, I remember boop, 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 mm-hmm. court case file, settled, movie out three years later. Right. Mm-hmm. Think about it. And think about the people that are sitting on stories like that. Yes. Don't we don't want you to die in the stories in the grave. <laughs> no. We want you to come Child. and tell it now. In your <laughs> casket, and the story yeah. is tucked right underneath your bed. Right there. Your thumb. Yeah. With right. my don't cake. Now, but don't yeah, that's my the- cake. <laughs> <laughs> I told you when I die, Nika, you better put that cake in there. <laughs> <Mm-mm-mm>. <laughs> Look, you got your story. Do not die with your hand across your chest. And that story tucked underneath your thumb. That's what right. is it going to do, right? right. What you going right. to even even think about this? Even if you never got it done, you could leave money behind for your descendants to just publish it in your funeral program mm-hmm. as a final act of maybe I didn't get it done in my lifetime, but somebody's going to know this, and somebody's maybe one of those descendants it. read is reading that is going to take it forth. That's right. Oh, that was good. I hope yes, y'all, it I was. Hope you, hey, now. I mean, you know, just think about the people. Look at look at the work that Angela Walton Raji has done. Look at what James Morgan has done. Come on now, you guys. Seriously. Like just think. I are, mean, we wouldn't have it. We wouldn't have any of that. We and wouldn't and have it. well, and that's the thing. Maybe start small. Because sometimes small. jumping out like this is a lot for people, especially if you're an introvert. I'm an extrovert, right? But jumping out like this and taking a risk, right? You know, the great Ava said, if it doesn't scare you, is it really worth doing? Right. I remember, I surely do, Angela, Bernice, I'll never stop saying it. They kept on encouraging me, encouraging me, encouraging me. My, my first blog post was maybe a paragraph and a picture. And that was it. And I was, I ran. So just start small, you know, it, it could just be a photo. It could just be something that somebody gave you, you know, take a photo of it and just, just take what you got in your mind and your books and just in your research and just, and just start small. I, I do recommend that because that's how I started. And mm-hmm. I thank God. Okay. I'm all right. Look where I'm at now. So you're still you here. Know, you still yeah, here. I'm still here. I still survived it. That fear did not kill me. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. And you know what? That's yeah. the, that's the other thing I will say too, is maybe you think you have something you want to do. I highly suggest consume the type of media, a lot of it that you're thinking about putting it into, but not like the same genre. Right. So if you want to do a documentary, don't watch historical documentaries, maybe watch hip hop evolution on Netflix, or maybe the mind of Aaron uh, 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 Hernandez or something else, or maybe you want to do a dramatic movie, watch that fall from grace situation on, on Netflix. So you figure out what wigs you're not going to buy or whatever it is. Right. (laughs) So here's the thing. You have to know what you want and what you don't want, especially when you get into moving pictures, because if you get producers and other people involved, they're going to try to sway you in different directions. And, And if you're very true to the story, right. You want to take you want to take into consideration people who have more experience, but you don't want it to be so out there that you looking crazy and your continuity is is bad and folks are supposed to be eating in the background and they ain't even got food on their plates. Let me stop talking about that movie. <laughs> Anywho, <laughs> all right, the diner scene, <laughs> the diner scene. <laughs> if you okay, this those is people were working. <laughs> the people if there's a diner scene and the folks don't have no food and no water on. <laughs> How about you look like you're putting slippers on and you come downstairs with no slippers? <laughs> <laughs> we want you to have the continuity. We want you to hire the person that is there for continuity to make sure the wigs and stuff are straight, right? But at the end of the day, like I said, you got to consume things so you know what you want and what you don't want. And some of it is visual. It's aesthetic. It's what you hear, it's what you don't mm-hmm. hear. 
you know, but you've got to consume a lot of different stuff um, and just repurpose. Y'all, y'all know um, I am. And Angela has said, if you on Facebook, inbox me, we could talk about blogs. <laughs> She's put that out there. Yes, I did throw shade at I, Tyler. Yes, you got that studio. We love you. But that movie was janky. <laughs> All right. Moving on. What the viewers are saying. Uh, Reverend Angela Walter Raji, because <laughs> officially he give her that title tonight. I can already hear her laugh. Uh, she said the struggle to tell the story, uh, to find the story, and then to tell it well. That's that is really what you're what you're that's the crux of what we're talking about. It's very true. Just sometimes the story is a small story. It does not have to be six generations. <laughs> you right. Denise Muhammad, sometimes I feel like I have to get it all out. It makes for one long blog post, which is not always a good thing. We are more of the chop, chop, chop it up, make it a pie. Make it palatable, part one, part two, part three. We like that. Ellen knows I am a, if I got to scroll more than more than three times, I'm not going to read it. I, yeah. I tell you guys this all the time. Even my own stuff. I'm like, oh, this is too long. I got to break this up. You know, consider that. I know I'm always telling them about that. But but uh, yeah, yeah, consider that. Michelle Marzen, this is great. I'm an art teacher and have always wanted to create an animation slash cartoon stop motion picture of our family story. Let me tell you guys something, and I'm gonna have to come off of screen share right now for this. Y'all know Hair Love is up for an Oscar. Yes. Let's, yes. Talk about, yes. let's talk about my cousin. I love it. <laughs> my cousin by proxy, okay? Matthew <laughs> Cherry got the whole idea from watching, from looking at pictures of black men doing their kids' hair on, on social media and decided, okay, we're gonna put together a book, put, decided to get, he is, he's a filmmaker, you guys. He is not a writer. He is not a writer. He is not an illustrator. Went to Kickstarter. We're gonna fund, we're gonna fund putting this book together. I put my little money in. Did anybody else donate to Hair Love besides me? All right. So we have folks donate to Hair Love. So they got the book put together, was given constant updates. Then Sony Pictures came in, got the rights, got Vashti Harrison to, to do the illustration, right? Because she's on Sul Sulye uh, from uh, Lupita Nyong'o's book. She also did the illustration for that. So Sony Pictures comes in, creates an animated short, and it's now up for Oscar. It could wow, potentially sorry. win an Oscar this wow. weekend. Oh, and speaking of Sony, um, this just came to mind um the Harrison family um every you know where I live is called Harrison country and everybody in genealogy know about the famous Harrison family okay Henry Winecheck wrote the book um the Harrisons in black and white well Sony Pictures has been here and they've brought, bought the rights to Henry Winecheck's book so now there's going to be a movie made about the Harrisons no see see and and let me let me just put this out there for free come close because I'm gonna tell you something these production companies are searching the internet and looking for the research. Mm -hmm. And if it's not out there, they're going to tell your story. And they don't feel like they have to ask permission. They won't even, they won't even send you anything. But if you just blog it, put it on your family tree, then you'll have somebody reach out to you for rights to tell the story. Otherwise, they'll just consider them a public figure and they'll just pay you when you when you say that you're infringing on the on the right to tell somebody's story. We talked about that. Uh, we talked about that during uh, the episode of Birthright, right? When we had uh, yes. uh, mm -hmm. the, the lynching descendant and how right. his family story had been co-opted. Right. Yeah, I just want to just want to put that out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. It's time for your favorite part of the show, Black Progen Lives, Ask Mariah. This is the part of the show where you, the viewer, submit your questions, queries, conundrums, and more to the panel, and we weigh in live with research help, specifically geared towards you. Panelists, never see the queries beforehand. Reese, did you see the query beforehand? No. Okay, and, and Andre, did you see it beforehand? Nope. You did not, and, and, and neither did Ellen, and neither did Bernice, and neither nope. did True. Nope. Ain't Have nobody no seen that. Mm -mm. Exactly. <laughs> So you get a chance to see us work together live to help our genie buds get past their brick walls. Tonight, Ask Mariah is from Amanda Hill. Amanda girl, let us know if you're in the chat room. Otherwise, we're just going to start talking, trying to help you. Her question is, I am searching for my great grandfather's maternal line, namely his mother, Janie Irons, who died August 28th, 1940 in Aberdeen, Mississippi. So she's looking for her great grandfather's maternal line. His, namely his mother. So this would be her great-great-grandmother, Janie Irons, 
who died August 28, 1940 in Aberdeen, Mississippi. What she's found, verifiable document that she has is the 1940 census in Aberdeen, Mississippi, taking ancestry DNA. That's all we got. Now, you know, the first thing I'm going to say, and this is what Nika always says, don't you ever rule out that anything exists if you have not taken your tail down to the state of Mississippi. You absolutely 110% cannot say that something doesn't exist or people are unfindable for that state. That state is, y'all will hear about it in two weeks. <laughs> um, well, one but, thing I can say is that you found my great grandmother's marriage license. In what state? In Mississippi. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you got to know your way around. She's saying, my question is, how do you know that Janie is tied to him? What is the evidence that you have? Because we don't know. You just said a census, but how do you not, how do you know she died on August 28, 1940? How do we know that? Right. And where's the death certificate? And we know you ain't got one because the state of Mississippi don't have more line. <laughs> So did you go to Mississippi and get the death certificate? Did you write them? Did you find an obituary? What happened? Um, Were they like names? Yeah, is there a bitch and obituary? Yes, Amanda is here. She is in the chat. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they... sorry, sorry, Amanda, to be antagonistic, but you know we love Mississippi, but we hate it. Exactly. <laughs> God damn so. Mississippi, they say. <laughs> Were the name changes? Uh, were there any name changes? That's what Ellen's saying. Dante uh, Eubank Irons. says, yeah. uh, uh, Dante Eubank says, and you have to go to Mississippi. And he put a hundred <laughs> exclamation points. Have to go to Mississippi. <laughs> he yeah. said, Lord, my Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, you can shake your hand. Reese, I should take you there on a research trip just so you can see what we are talking yes. about. You too. Yes. Right. I've never can you put her grandmother's Mississippi. name back up there again, please? Yeah, of course Ms. I can. Iron, Janie Irons. Ms. Irons. Janie Irons. Yeah, Janie yeah. Irons. Um, she, we, it doesn't, we, there's no birth information. She says she has been to Aberdeen. Okay, we got to give her applause on, on taking the research trip. Yes, hey. yes, yes. Uh, she says she has been to her grave site. So hello, okay. that's first oh. person research. So that, you know what, you, you didn't already, half the questions we got for you, you have already kind of, um, have you been, uh, so she, clearly she's been to the courthouse if she's been there local. She had five name changes, bless you, bless you. Oh, wait, yes. Granddaddy Daddy Ooh. Ike stuff going on. <laughs> <laughs> Was she Janie Johnson at one time? Was she Janie Johnson at one time? She says she never had a social security number. So that's not um, an option to look for a social security application. Um, I'm thinking um, family search catalog. You know, I always send people there. That is my go-to. If you don't know about it, God bless you, but you need to learn about that family search. Uh, go to catalog and then look at your ancestral location, see what they have online that's already scanned. Um, a lot of Mississippi records are available for you at home. You don't have to be at a family history center to get to them. Um, and so she, and then let's see, uh, never had a social security number. Um, I don't know if there are two people who are in the chat room who are connected to this, uh, cause folks are, uh, okay. Maybe it's just somebody, uh, commenting, uh, Angela, she passed away, um, on August 28th, 1940, which to me, since she's been to the cemetery, sounds like she might've gotten that off the headstone. I would, uh, I would potentially write to maybe vital statistics or um, cause I'm trying to think Mississippi, the death records only go, they only, the stuff that's at the archives only goes to the thirties. I think maybe 33, maybe 38. So she might just be on the cusp the of being cusp able to of, get a yeah, uh -huh. certificate. She says she was native American and white taken at 14 years old. No, she was not ever a Johnson. She was orange, an orange, a Scott and a Smith. Okay. Uh, the other question I have, and of course I know the right Reverend Angela Walton Raji is going to ask this as well. What proof do you have that she was Native American? Um, she mm -hmm. died in front of her great aunt. Ooh, mm -hmm. wow! Well, there's a story right there. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. a story right there. Um, she got a time? Yeah. Okay. Dante's got a great suggestion. Uh, he says because of where Aberdeen is, you may need to check Alabama records as well as Lamar County, Alabama. Um, other, other, yeah, because yeah, I didn't know where that county was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, other suggestions. Um, people are asking if her children have social security applications, maybe to look for that. Um, I would say local records, deeds, 
um, in particular in Aberdeen. Um, I don't know if you looked at that um, to see if maybe property was left to her as a result of maybe one of her husbands dying because she sounds like a grandma Alice to me. That's my grandmother's grandmother who had, I asked her, I was like, granny, I'm seeing a lot of Alice, Alice. She said, oh, you know, grandma had like five husbands, you know? So it could have been the men were dropping, like dropping dead and she might have been getting the property or land that they had. Uh, she says, Amanda, Amanda says, my great aunt shared with that with me before she passed that, that she had died in front of her. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking. Did she live a long life or no? Her? Yeah. Did she live a long life? That's a great question. Um, she is on the census um and indentured by my great grandfather's father so that's mm -hmm. after 1870 1965 an indenture. In indenture the only thing i can think of for an indenture is like usually that's language used for property mortgages right on this it'd be on being you know enjoying this right. indenture i'm right. trying to understand what she's saying mm -hmm. um Dante suggests uh, checking Chickasaw, Itawamba, and Lowndes counties in Mississippi. Exactly. Uh, she says she passed away at age 69. So oh, she was okay. 69 in 1940. She was born in 1871. So the whole idea of indenturing is kind okay. of out of the window to me, right. I think, because yeah. we're dealing with- I'm with, uncomfortable with that word yeah. for that yeah. time frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Me too. What did her Which DNA really show? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah. What is the, what does the DNA show? Um, and right. Reverend Angela is in there cover the native American part. So we don't have to talk about that. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering I, if she uses the word indenture, I'm wondering if she's talking maybe about a labor contract. Freedman's view. That, would, that wouldn't be in 1870. Yeah. Right. That's, that's already beyond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, 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 that's what I'm saying. So, Oh, well, yeah. You're been right, a court thing later. though, maybe, or is it possible that there would have been a court obligation maybe, or. Well, usually some sharecropping stuff. That's what I'm saying. It yeah, would be like, oh, like, like a yeah. mortgage. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, like I, I've got a mortgage or like a supply contract with you. I agree right. to give you a bit of cotton for, and yeah. yeah. Um, Janie that, was on the, yeah. she says she was on the DAWs, but I am oh. have questions about that. Well, she was? Then how, are you sure you have At the right 10 Janie? years old? Or she would have been, well, how old would she have been though? Well, DAWs commission, most applications and stuff were 1890. Five okay. to 1901, oh, okay. 02. So she would have been a grown woman. But for Dawes Commission, you had to live in certain locations in order for you to be able to. So I, I, I would just question is she does she know she has the right person? Mm -hmm. She says Native American is on the DNA. Second great grandfather was a slave owner of the family. No. OK. Hmm. Well, here's my thing. Since we're delving into uh, Friedman research. If she's on the Dawes roll and she's on the Dawes card, yes, thank you, Angela. 1898 to 1914 is the range of those documents. Okay. If she's listed on a Freedman card, her slaveholder is listed there. The name is there. There's two sides of the card. The front part has the slaveholder of the person who's being, you know, documented. On the back, it's their parents and who their slaveholders were. If she's listed on a on a Freedman card. If she's on a by blood card, there's not going to be that, but there's an accompanying application with the card. If it's the right person, the person would then have to lay out who their parents are. And if she's not mentioning names and locations that are something that you know, to be fact, I would question whether or not you have the right person. Is it possible um, another, another set of the other register besides the doors? It might be might might work depending no? on the nation um angela said and then she's right she said there were mississippi choctaws but the yeah. uh the mcr records are rejected meaning that okay. they aren't people who can apply to get into the nation but those cards are and the files mm -hmm. are gold um she says mcr cards uh do not reflect slaves of choctaws so if she okay yeah yeah any other suggestions you guys can think of for her Maybe the newspapers. I'm not sure how um, yeah. Mississippi newspapers, if they even reported, um, you know, people of color in the newspaper during that time. Because, yeah. you know, a lot of them didn't. But, you know, in my case here, <laughs> um, you know, like I was telling you earlier, Nika, I get stuck on the newspapers. It's, it's just a wealth of information. So it, it can be an obituary. Also, yeah, the educable children. Right. Uh, she may find the children of Janie Irons, which True. means that the mother's name would also be listed. Yeah, which you'd have to look 
prim- I would say you look under the children, but you also could look under her name. But then for her, it's less parent. likely because she, yeah, because she would be under five different names potentially. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Because she said she's been married a lot of times. Um, mm-hmm. All right. Well, we're going to move on. Um, there's lots of great suggestions in the in the chat room. Um, I think for the, the, the Dawes angle, just because she's on a Bly Bud card, I, you've got to really rectify that. And there's enough resources, the application packet that goes along with the card. Um, to ver- really verify if you have the right person. I think looking at deed records, we suggested that DNA matches, doing targeted testing on your family to who are uh, to people who are other descendants of her or have a connection to her um, and seeing who you all have in common. And maybe those folks know a little bit more information than you do um, mm-hmm. in terms of trying to find your family history. Um, she, she says the other side of the family shared the same story that Janie was stolen from the reservation. She used so many names. I lived with she says she lived with her great grandfather. Oh. It's just a matter okay. of fleshing out a lot of surnames yeah. and, mm-hmm. and locations right. and things. So mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So and and getting your timelines together. Where she's yes. supposed to be? When? What do you have documented? Where? Um, and uh, okay, great. All right. Well, um, thank you, Dante. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dante's chat room is flying. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, hopefully, um, we've given you some great suggestions on things you can do um, going forward to to try and um, get you more information. All right, moving on. If you need help with your family history research, submit to Black Pro Gen Lives. Ask Mariah for a chance to have experts weigh in to help you get past your genealogy research hurdles. A link to submit is in the description of each and every episode of the show. Remember to be super specific. Let us know what records you searched, what oral history you have, if you've DNA tested, and more. The more you tell us, the better. You just may be selected to be featured on one of our upcoming episodes. Of course, we're so excited because Black Pro Gen is going ham, <laughs> going just crazy during Black History Month this, this year. We'll be joining you again on next Tuesday, February 11th at 8 p.m. Central. We're going to be talking all about the hit series on OWN, Queen Sugar, OWN being the Oprah Winfrey Network. And uh, we're going to be addressing the show from a genealogical standpoint. Oh my gosh, it's going down because there's so much good stuff on the show. <laughs> yes, it is a lot. We love Queen Sugar. I think me, Ellen, there's several of us that watch Queen Sugar. So um, I've heard a lot of uh, great chatter um, uh, from our social circles about this, this next uh, Twitter chat. So be sure to join us for crew chat. It's a Twitter chat. Um, you get to follow the hashtag. We send out prompts or questions that will help you think about the TV shows or the movies. Those are the themes for this year that um, we're talking about from a genealogical family history perspective. You'll pick up new tips, tricks. Um, the one we did last night on Roots was great. A ton of resources shared for books, uh, websites. I mean, all kinds of stuff. It was flying. It was great. So if you missed it, you want to kind of see what it's like, go and search the hashtag crew chat on Twitter and you can kind to see what was going on. So be sure to join us next Tuesday, February 11th, 8 p.m. Central for Queen Sugar, uh, our next crew chat. And then the next day, our next live episode will be next Wednesday, February 12th at 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. And it's going to be entitled Jumping the Broom, Researching Marriages, Unions, and More. And the two souls become one. Marriage records are crucial when it comes to tracing family lines, learn the history behind them, how to locate them, and how the information they hold can lead to more finds. Again, tune in live Wednesday, February 12th for episode 104. You can also visit whoisnikasmith.com for a full schedule of all of our episodes for 2020. And then of course, we're going to continue with Black History Month. We've got another episode. We actually have two more, right? We're going to be having four episodes this month during Black History Month. Continuing with the series, tune in on Tuesday, February 18th, 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern for our live taping of Tracing the Trade, Slavery in Louisiana. Louisiana and Mississippi. Ooh, this is going to be a good one. Y'all ain't even read day. Louisiana and Mississippi were important locations when it comes to slavery within the United States and the migration of the enslaved from the Upper South to the Lower South. In this episode, learn the ins and outs of researching the slave trade in these two important locations that'll be airing live Tuesday, February 18th. We'll be going back to Tuesdays. Woohoo! 
done with basketball season <laughs> by the third week of February. I know that's why we're on Wednesday. Sorry, y'all. Hey, look, I'm working it out. And of course, before we go, I've got to send out a extra special shout out to our patrons who have gone above and beyond the support content being generated for people of color, genealogy, research, and family history. Special thanks to Sandra Henderson, Devet Himes, Sir Williams, Marquita Fletcher, Michelle Mahler. Hey, I see you in the chat room. My true boots. I don't know if I know that lady or not. Shelby Cowan, <laughs> Cecilia Matoya Charles, Patriva Mack. I see you in the chat room. Tierra Cotton Kello. I also see you in the chat room. And Denise Muhammad. I see you too. K. Charles Lloyd, Tim. Tammy Ozier, Sasha, Sasha Johnson, Henriette Kane, Ruth Collins, Felicia Addison, Police, uh, Pamela Devana, Pamela Tyler, Deborah Singleton, Tony Carrier, Tina Jones. All of you, thank you so much for your support. And that's it. That's the show. We love you. Thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget, tune in to Black Pro Gen Live's crew chat on Tuesday coming up along with the next episode next Wednesday. We hope you have a great week. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye-bye.